Okay. Well, in the in the sake of everyone's time, uh, we'll get started. I know people are still logging in. Um, those that don't know me, I'm Jason. I'm the Institute of Holistic Nutrition Vancouver Campus Manager, as well as Program Advisor for IHN Online. And welcome to tonight's talk, uh, Novel Approaches to Dysbiosis in Clinical Practice. I mean, we all know how important the gut is and uh, really excited for this topic. Tonight's speaker has a, his uh, list of credentials and accomplishments is about as long as the digestive tract. Uh, and just as impressive, but uh, don't read them all. <laughs> <laughs> so Brett Haas is a 2006 IHN graduate, uh, also certified in functional medicine. He has practiced Ayurveda, iridology, holistic nutrition, has done extensive work with First Nations and studied shamanic medicine. He's helped thousands of clients in his clinical practice overcome a variety of issues with his primary focus being complex digestive issues and autoimmune disease. He's been an instructor here at IHN for 15 years, teaching a variety of subjects, and also has a digestive health practitioner masterclass. So please join me in welcoming Brett. And um, yeah, I look forward to this just as much as everyone else. Thanks, Brett. Cool. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for the uh, warm intro. Um, and without further ado, I'm actually just going to jump right in to tonight's presentation. Um, let me get it teed up here. So just bear with me. Uh, okay, can everyone see that? Uh, should be coming through now. Uh, yeah, is that good, Jason? Awesome. All right. So um, welcome to tonight's presentation. Um, as Jason said, my name is Brett. I'll do a lightning fast intro because Jason did such a great job. Uh, tonight, we are going to be talking about novel approaches to dysbiosis in clinical practice. Um, I'll give you a heads up on what's coming up in just a second. Uh, for those of you that maybe have not uh, met me before, um, again, just a quick intro. As Jason said, functional medicine, holistic nutrition, I'm also a podcaster. Um, I'm coming up on 20 years in clinical practice, which is kind of crazy when I say that out loud. Um, so I have also been teaching at IHN um, on and off since 2007. So I don't know how many years that is. I think 17 um, my wheelhouse is really gut health, hormones, and autoimmune disease. And as my career and practices sort of evolved, um, I always tell people, you know, I didn't choose to do a lot of these things. They, I just sort of found my way into them. And as I got further and further into it, I started realizing that a lot of these things were very, very interconnected and that a lot of people coming in with autoimmune issues um, also had um, gut health issues and also had hormone issues, right? And so people coming in with hormone issues often had gut health issues and so on and so forth. And so that's kind of like led me down this path over many, many years um, of really diving deep into how all of these things connect. And that's exactly why I have masterclasses on all three of those subjects and not really anything else, right? Um, I have also founded a Holistic Health Masterclass. Some of you might know me from that and more recently practiced online. Um, which is a little bit more of the technology, business, marketing uh, side of um, the clinical work. Okay, so um, again, I'm not going to belabor this here, but just uh, these are some of the supplement companies I've worked with. Um, I have done a lot of training, formulation, education, a variety of different roles, and then also worked with the NHPPA and um, Children's Health Defense and Detox Project, a little bit more on the activist side of things, if you will, um, under a variety of topics there as well. And um, I'm actually now sitting on the board for Children's Health Defense in Canada, which is um, also exciting and a little bit crazy all at the same time. So that's a little bit about me. Um, what's coming up tonight? Uh, these are just some of the high level uh, topics here. Um, exploring the microbiome. Um, I think we're going to crack that open and um, expand on that a little bit more, um, you know, at, over and above what we would normally just consider um, gut bacteria. Okay. Understanding the nuances of dysbiosis. This is very, very important. You know, my goal tonight is not necessarily to give you um, hard and fast protocols for every single situation. Um, I think a more zoomed out approach, you know, and getting you to think differently about dysbiosis and different types of scenarios, right, is really what my goal is tonight. So uh, a little bit on how poor digestion leads to gut infections and dysbiosis. Uh, we'll do an introduction to GI MAP testing, uh, look at some dysbiotic scenarios and health conditions, 
Um, just in the interest of time tonight, you know, I'm really choosing, I've chosen two. Uh, so what we're going to talk about is we're going to look at um, acid reflux and H. pylori, and then we'll also look at SIBO, and then we'll sort of move forward and expand that open uh, a little bit more. Um, lastly, or last few points here, redefining our approach to dysbiosis, uh, rethinking antimicrobial therapy, and then uh, we'll wrap things up with a framework for working with dysbiosis in uh, practice. All right. So what we're going to do as well is um, if we want to, uh, if you have questions, um, you can put them in the Q&A box and we'll kind of get to them uh, near the end. All right. So typically, you know, when people think of the microbiome, um, well, let me put that question to you, right? So what is the microbiome? And, you know, hit me up in the chat. Uh, I'm curious to know what your understanding or definition is of the microbiome. So, um, Feel free to post in the chat, and I've got that open. And uh, let's see what we come up with. Anyone? Okay, and I think I've changed that. So let me see here. All right. Okay, so um, people are a little shy. That's okay. That's all good, right? So when people think of um, the microbiome, typically, if I polled a bunch of people, they would simply say things like, gut bacteria. Okay. So gut flora, gut bacteria, uh, the environment of our gut and so forth. But I prefer to take a much broader look at the microbiome. And you'll see why as we move forward in this presentation, the organisms that live in and on us. And so when you actually look at this, what you find is that we actually have different microbiomes. And so typically when people talk about the microbiome, yes, they talk about the gut microbiome and that's obviously where the focal point is. But when we start to look at things like the oral microbiome, you know, the, the gut oral um, connection is uh, huge now, right? That axis is being actively explored and we will take a little peek into that as we move forward tonight. Another big one here is the skin. And so we know, I mean, there's, there's very, very clear data on um, certain types of bacteria and certain types of conditions in the gut that trigger skin issues. You know, one only has to think of things like eczema, um, psoriasis is probably the, the poster child for that. And so what it really shows us is that when we work on the gut microbiome, we actually start to influence all the other microbiomes, right? And so as we move forward here and start to categorize and identify um, what dysbiosis is, We'll come back to this and sort of expand on this a little bit more. But, you know, just take a look on the left-hand side. I mean, look at all of these things that are impacted by our microbiome that for the average person probably would think that this is completely unrelated, okay? You know, look at uh, psychiatric disorders, right? Diabetes, metabolic syndrome, you know, how many people would peg that down to disruptions in the gut microbiome? Uh, for the skin side of things here, um, you know, obviously uh, acne is another big one. You know, we didn't mention that um, certain allergies and so forth. All right. So uh, nonetheless, not to linger there, um, but suffice to say that, uh, you know, I prefer to take a what's called a polyfocal um, perspective on the microbiome okay, versus just zooming in on the gut. So if we uh, look at the microbiome here, you can see the overwhelming majority of the organisms that uh, colonize the body. Um, our bacteria, okay? Yes, we have yeast and fungi, um, you know, in the gut particularly, a very, very small percentage. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about protozoa, um, not so much about viruses today. And uh, yeah, you know, you can sort of see here this 10 to 1. Um, bacteria and organisms, I should say more correctly, outnumber um, the cells in the body by 10 to 1, which is kind of crazy to think about. So some key notes here. We have a couple of things that we need to wrap our head around first. The first one is normal or common cell bacteria, sometimes referred to as keystone bacteria. So if you hear me say keystones, uh, sometimes I'll just sort of use different words. Uh, keystones, common cells, uh, normal. Uh, sometimes people would call these probiotics or good flora. Okay, those are all kind of the same thing. We then have this group called opportunistic bacteria. And opportunistic bacteria, as the name suggests, are opportunists. So if there's a uh, crack in the shield, if the, our defenses are down, if we're stressed out, uh, if the environment's conducive, they're going to take a foothold and become overgrown. And then we have fungi, yeast, um, viruses. And, you know, 
parasites, which is interesting, you know, so I put parasites with a question mark because there's some chatter right now about whether parasites are common cells or not, right? Because they do just like yeast and candida, they do actually offer some benefits as well. And so that's an interesting conversation that's uh, happening right now. But what you can see, um, the pop-up there, 90% of the gut microbiome is actually the normal or common cell bacteria, and then the opportunistic bacteria as well. So the highest variety of strains that we've identified is around 300. Uh, some studies have shown 500 or even 1,000. Um, those have sort of been not debunked, but people have sort of questioned the validity, uh, especially the 1,000 one. Most healthy adults, though, uh, if you look um, at numbers and healthy cohorts, uh, somewhere between 125 to 250 different strains. Uh, bacteria, we know um, the, the sort of colony or microbial makeup differs uh, between the small intestine and the colon. And if we break those down to the four main family families or phyla of the human microbiome, um, we have bacteria, DDs, Firmicutes, those are the real big ones. Um, actinobacteria, proteobacteria, and then others as well. Okay, so as we're going to see, whereas we get into some GI map stuff tonight, uh, you're going to see that the bacteria DDs and the Firmicutes really come up um, a lot there, and they have their own category um, on the test. So, um, as as said before, um, influences many different body processes. Uh, some of these are obvious. Some of these are not obvious. Uh, you know, you think of things like neurotransmitters, for example. Um, you know, brain chemicals, basically. Uh, a lot of that's happening in the gut. Dare I say most of it. Uh, hormone synthesis and metabolism, mood and brain function, uh, general metabolic function, and then blood sugar regulation. Okay, so with some of that groundwork out the way, uh, I want to move into some of the fun stuff here. And what is dysbiosis, right? So let's uh, see what the chat has to say about this. Okay. Anyone want to take a guess? Anyone want to have a stab at the definition? What would you define dysbiosis as? Anyone? So some people saying leaky guts, unbalanced bacteria, imbalance in the guts. Okay, excess of opportunistic, lack of good bacteria. Sure. Overgrowth of bacteria in the guts. Okay. Anyone else? Imbalance between beneficial and potentially pathogenic. Sure. Disruption of flora and imbalance between the good guys and the bad guys. Okay, great. So no wrong answers. Um, so typically when people think of dysbiosis, we think of good guys versus bad guys, right? And that's a very old school way of thinking. It's not incorrect. It's not incorrect. I think um, it's incomplete, right? And so when we actually look at some technical definitions here, changes that disrupt the normal balance of microbial communities leading to an increase in harmful microorganisms, a decrease in beneficial ones, and you'll see I've highlighted here, or a reduction in microbial diversity, right? So a reduction in the number, the diversity, the different types of strains that we have. And I think that's very, very relevant um, to the discussion that we're going to have uh, tonight. Further, um, a pathological imbalance. Okay, so pathological. In other words, it's actually causing some type of disease or disorder in the body, or maladaptation in the composition of the microbiome. So this is interesting, right? So composition again, so it's the, the actual makeup. And I want you to think here for a minute, it's not just good guys versus bad guys. We might actually have an imbalance between the good guys. Too many of certain types of good guys, not enough of others. We might have um, oppor same thing with the opportunists, right? Because what you got to realize is that all of these organisms, particularly the bacteria, there's a lot of competition going on. There's a lot of cross-feeding going on. You know, so it's a very, very dynamic um, environment there that's always changing. Okay, um, I don't want to say it's changing to the degree where it's changing permanently, but it's changing You know, as we're talking right now. Things are changing, changing, changing according to our environment, our diet, all sorts of other things. So typically within the human gut, but also applicable to other microbiota, such as those on the skin, in the mouth, respiratory tract, or urogenital tracts, right? So this is important because, again, I've helped a lot of people with skin issues. And where do I go? I go straight to the gut first. And usually I don't have to do anything on the skin. Okay, so cleaning up the gut improves skin. 
and so on. So to expand on this a little further, alterations in microbial composition, which we've discussed, reduced microbial diversity and richness, changes in microbial metabolic activity. Okay, so this is an important one because what we need to realize is that these organisms are not just hanging out, right? They're not just hanging out and going, oh my gosh, I'm just going to digest food and um, you know exist and, and keep the bad guys crowded out. In actual fact, we know that they produce metabolites. Some of the ones that I've listed here, uh, many B vitamins are produced by uh, microbes in the gut, uh, vitamin K, short-chain fatty acids, GABA, and so on and so forth. Okay, so when we have alterations and disturbances there, it's not just the bacteria levels themselves, it's all of these beneficial end products that also become compromised over time. Uh, impaired gut barrier function, so someone said leaky gut, it doesn't always have to be leaky per se, uh, but definitely it's going to be impaired and not functioning optimally. And then the last point there, changes in bacterial localization, meaning that we could have translocation of bacteria from one area to the other uh, in the body. Um, the oral gut axis, which we spoke about earlier, uh, we could have biofilm formation where they sort of hide out from the immune system and from uh, antimicrobials. And of course, changes to the host tissues and the mucin layer as well in the gut. So all of these things are possible uh, when it comes to dysbiosis. So quick introduction to GI map testing. Um, I'm not going to go through the report and everything just in the interest of time. But uh, if you're new to GI map testing, uh, this is a non-invasive stool test, which is done at home uh, by your clients or patients. Uh, it uses Q, so quantitative PCR technology. Uh, as opposed to standard PCR. It provides absolute values instead of relative values of organisms, and hence the name quantitative. So it actually provides us a, with a number, not just an identification marker. Uh, it is considered a gold standard as far as pathogen screening goes, but it does also measure non-pathogens plus other intestinal markers. And so if we look at that, uh, here we see bacterial, yeast, fungal, and viral markers, uh, parasites, worms, amoeba, Digestion and absorption markers. Um, so elastase one there. You know, I'll be coming back to some of these things here in a minute. But elastase one uh, gives us insight into pancreatic function. Uh, steatocrit gives us insight into gallbladder function. Uh, inflammation, um, immunology, uh, intestinal health, leaky gut. So zonulin is the leaky gut marker, and it is an optional add-on. And then we also have drug and antibiotic resistance, um, depending on what organisms uh, might come up. Okay, so let's talk quickly, because we have to talk about this. I mean, we can't just um, leave this aside if we're going to talk about dysbiosis. So poor digestion, the microbiome, and infections. I I've sort of started shying away from the word infection, because I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit short-sighted. Um, it's really an imbalance, okay, uh, in or dysbiosis. So when we look at digestion, I'm not going to go through everything here, but there's a couple of things I have to pull out. The biggest one that I have to pull out is when you look at food going into the mouth, food is going to travel down the esophagus into the stomach. And we've got this sort of like um, esophageal sphincter here or cardiac sphincter at the top. We've got a um, pyloric sphincter at the bottom. And what happens here, this is one of the most important parts of digestion, is the secretion of stomach acid. And so stomach acid, you know, most people think that stomach acid just, um, you know, it just breaks down protein, right? And that's kind of it. Uh, stomach acid actually has other roles that are very relative to um, things like bacterial or microbial sterilization and also triggering things further down, like the pancreas, in the gallbladder. So low stomach acid, right? Not everyone with dysbiosis has low stomach acid, but again, we have to just talk about it in this context because a lot of people do. But low stomach acid does not sterilize pathogens. It does not trigger the pancreas and the gallbladder. So this is exactly why we have the elastase and the steatocrit markers there. And sometimes when those are imbalanced, especially when you match that with symptoms, that's a pretty good indicator that someone's uh, stomach acid is low. Uh, low enzyme output, right? Because the pancreas is not working, so we don't break down our food. Undigested food feeds microbes. Poor bile flow. You know, here's another one. 
when people think of bile, they always think of bile as uh, fat digesting, which is true. But bile also has very, very um, subtle but powerful antimicrobial properties. It also is involved with changing the pH in the gut. So when it's not flowing, we start to have problems here uh, in these areas. And changes in pH across the GI tract, which we just we were just talking about. And of course, all of this can precipitate damage to the gut lining, which paves the way for leaky gut, autoimmune diseases, food allergies, systemic toxicity, inflammation, and a whole bunch more. Okay. I think most of us are pretty familiar with that. Now, when you look at the uh, pattern here on a GI map, and look, uh, some of the stuff I've taken straight from the reports from GI map, some of the stuff I'll share is from my own clinical files. This is straight off of the GI map. And the things that I want to point out here is you'll see the keynotes here. So this type of pattern where we're going to see H. pylori is moderate to high. H. pylori is one of those things. It's a bacteria that is supposed to be sterilized by uh, stomach acid. And when we have low stomach acid, H. pylori can really become overgrown. And then what H. pylori does is it actually suppresses stomach acid production. So it's sort of this like, you know, um, it's almost like a, like a self-fulfilling um, prophecy, if you will, where it just keeps on going, keeps on going and gets worse and worse. So when you see H. pylori high, you can know, you can be almost certain that it is suppressing stomach acid to some degree or another. What you're also going to see here, um, oftentimes, is you'll see high levels of phyla, right? High levels of bacteria, high levels of normal flora. You're going to see uh, moderate to high levels of opportunists. But most importantly, look at these intestinal health markers here. So elastase 1 is going to be unbalanced. So there's your pancreas. And steatocrit is also going to be unbalanced. There's your gallbladder. And that's exactly what we see in the keynotes here. So uh, insufficient bile acids, poor digestion. So pancreatic insufficiency or brush border enzyme deficiency. And then, of course, reduced absorption. And this is also an important one here altered gastrointestinal motility. You know, so a lot of people, when they look at bacteria like that, they just think of numbers and levels, but certain types of bacteria, they produce gas. And that gas can actually speed up or slow down motility. And based on what it's doing, that can actually then, again, fuel more of that overgrowth. Uh, and we're going to take a look at SIBO here in just a minute. Um, so, uh, you know, sit tight. We'll have more to say on that in just a second. Right, so... Let's look at a couple of scenarios here. And I, as I said in the beginning, a couple of scenarios that we picked or I picked, um, one is a heartburn, acid reflux, or GERD, and uh, the other one will be SIBO. So we'll kind of look at that. So when we talk about acid reflux, the most common symptoms are heartburn, regurgitation, um, so sort of like spitting back up, and then difficulty swallowing. Less common symptoms here include coughing, chest pain, excessive salivation, belching, and a sour taste in the mouth. And all of these are aggravated by lying down at night. And when we look at the root causes here, aside from functional issues, right? So functional issues, um, you know, I've had a lot of my clients where if I send them for osteopathic or chiropractic adjustments, it really makes a big difference to the reflux. And that's sort of a little bit outside of uh, what we do as nutritionists, right? So functional issues aside, um, allergies, right? Or sensitivities. So sometimes those can um, aggravate things. Uh, hiatal hernia, uh, where things are pinched in the diaphragm. Again, that's sort of lumped under functional issues. But the two that I've highlighted here, uh, H. pylori, which is present in 40% of GERD patients, and low stomach acid, which we covered just a minute ago. So we're going to zoom in on H. pylori here because it is present in a high number of people. And let's just look at some symptoms of low stomach acid first, uh, because this is um, somewhat of the picture when you look at acid reflux. So I should probably preface this by saying people often think of acid reflux as too much acid. Okay. And when they think of too much acid, they think it's an overproduction of stomach acid. In actual fact, it's usually an underproduction of stomach acid. And the way that it works is, you know, very much like a washing machine. If I put food in the top, uh, the washing machine is my stomach. I close the top door, I close the bottom door, and I put in my detergent, which is the HCL, the stomach acid. If I don't have enough detergents, 
my washing machine doesn't wash the clothes properly. And what happens is the washing machine will hold on to those clothes. The clothes will stay there for longer and they'll start to produce fermentation acids. And it's really the fermentation acids that are actually traveling back up the esophagus and causing all the problems. And so here, when you look at the symptoms of low stomach acid, a lot of these map very, very nicely and neatly onto uh, acid reflux and GERD. So bloating, belching, and flatulence immediately or shortly after meals. Key distinction from bloating that's happening much later on. Uh, heartburn, which was obviously what we're talking about here. Indigestion, diarrhea, or constipation. Undigested food in stools. Rectal itching, chronic candida, food allergies. Uh, chronic iron, B12 or folate deficiency, okay, either with or without anemia. Widespread mineral deficiencies and then weak or peeling or cracked fingernails, okay? So this is by no means a complete list, but nonetheless, it's important to sort of push this forward and understand this uh, in the context of acid reflux and low HCL. So some of the GI map biomarkers that we really need to be looking out for, and I would encourage you to come back and watch the replay on this uh, once it's posted. Um, you know, pause the video, take some notes. I, I know there's a lot of uh, stuff we're covering tonight. Um, so H. pylori, you know, we spoke about that already. Okay, 40% of cases. Uh, the GI map is a very, very good test for H. pylori. Um, I'll show you a little bit more on the next slide as to what that looks like. Okay, um, low elastase. So that's my pancreas. Okay, so the pancreas is not functioning properly. High steatocrit. That means my gallbladder is not functioning properly. Okay, you don't have to have all of these, by the way. Low or high secretory IgA, so this tells me that my immune system is either overactive or it's underactive. And in many cases of dysbiosis, what we find is that the secretory IgA is very high when we're dealing with more of an acute situation. So in other words, we've got this like imbalance and these infections that we've been fighting for a short while. And the longer we keep fighting those, the more depressed the immune system comes. And so what I've come to see after doing, you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, stool tests is I'll see that people have been dealing with chronic infections. Uh, their immune system or Sig A here is actually very low. Okay, it's depressed. Some of the bacteria here that could become overgrown due to, to low stomach acid. Note that I've italicized could because uh, this is not always going to be the case, but oftentimes we'll find that particularly the highlighted ones here, so uh, Enterococcus, uh, Fecalis, and Fecium, and Streptococcus, particularly Streptococcus, which is a huge family, these actually colonize the oral microbiome to some degree or another. And what happens is as we're eating food every day and we're swallowing and so forth, our stomach acid should be sterilizing these. And what starts to happen is the, the uh, lack of sterilization causes the bacteria to go from the mouth down into the gut and then starts to become overgrown. So you'll often see this picture um, with people with low stomach acid, okay? And by extension, acid reflux, all right? But the big ones here, H. pylori and those first uh, three or four bullet points, all right? So when you look at the GI map, this is what it looks like. Um, and by the way, some of these reports that I'm sharing are, they might be a little bit of an older format because um, recently GI map updated the way that they report just visually. Um, so just, uh, yeah, if you do go poking around online, um, these are some of these are older. So here we can see H. pylori, um, you know, is is quite elevated, right? Um, you'll see, I'll talk to, talk about this in just a minute here. You have what's called virulence factors. And virulence factors, basically, the easiest way to explain it is how aggressive or how potentially pathogenic is something, right? So if we see H. pylori slightly elevated, and the virulence factors are absent, sometimes it's not a problem, right? Especially if someone is asymptomatic. Now, um, you know, doctors would always treat that with triple antibiotics. Like if H. pylori comes back positive on a test, everyone's going on triple antibiotics regardless of what's happening. I much prefer to look and see what's actually going on with the values here. Um, you know, are these virulence factors present or not? And uh, as we look at them, the big ones that I look out for are really the BAB-A, the CAG-A, and the VAC-A. Okay, so those are the ones that are a bit more aggressive. And if those come up, 
especially if someone is symptomatic, you definitely want to do something about it. Okay. And the reason why I say that is, you know, if you look at the global population, 50% of the global population have H. pylori, right? It's very, very prevalent. Yet not all 50% of the population has acid reflux or stomach cancer or ulcers or things like that. So I think we do need to look at it in the context of what's actually happening with the person itself. And sometimes, you know, uh, we're going to talk about this as we work uh, towards the end here. Uh, sometimes you got to be careful, right? Because what's going on with the rest of the microbiome? What's happening uh, with the good guys or the keystones? All right. So uh, this is what it would look like um, if you have uh, some of these other markers. So here we can see secretory IgA very, very high, right? Uh, Eli stage one there is uh, quite, not quite low. I mean, it's low. Uh, so again, this person might need some pancreatic support. Uh, if we zoom out and look at what else might be going on, they might have some other uh, bacterial imbalance going on and their immune system is really trying to uh, tackle that. Okay, so uh, digestive dysfunction on the GI map. Uh, so you can see here, these are markers that are associated with digestive dysfunction. And uh, this is kind of what we looked at before. So I'm just bringing this up as a reminder. But if we look now at the symptoms associated here, what do we see? Excess of gas and bloating stomach or abdominal discomfort, feeling of fullness after a meal, heartburn, or reflux. So this is exactly what we're going to see with acid reflux. Okay, so some steps here and points of consideration here. So we definitely want to take steps to restore HCL production. There's a bajillion different ways that we can do that. I just listed some of them here, uh, bitters, zinc, uh, vitamin B1 in high doses works really, really well. And then, of course, we could use betaine HCL as well. Uh, pancreatic and or gallbladder support if needed. So is, you know, what's happening with elastase? What's happening with steatocrit? Uh, proper food combining, absolutely essential, right? So, so not mixing our proteins and our carbs together uh, is going to really, you know, minimize the bloating. It's going to improve digestion and so forth. Uh, reducing the trigger foods or removing them. Usually we find spicy food, coffee, chocolate, alcohol. Um, some people have allergies as well. And you'll see I've highlighted here, what is the overall picture of gut health and the microbiome? Okay, that is what you need to look at. You know, people oftentimes when I'm doing training on uh, stool testing, particularly, people will often want to get into the weeds with all of the little things, right? And it's very, you know, if I can impart one thing with you tonight, it's more important to zoom out and have a look at that overall picture. What is that picture telling you when you look at it? And sometimes we'll talk about this near the end. Uh, sometimes, you know, minimal interventions will work well. Sometimes you need to take a more aggressive approach, but it really depends on what's going on. So address H. pylori if needed. Um, again, you want to assess symptomology there. If that person is asymptomatic and there's no virulence factors, does it need to be treated? Okay, I'm of the mindset and the school of thought that it doesn't, but again, a lot of people would disagree with that and say if it's present, wipe it out and treat it. Okay, there's a lot more to that conversation, uh, and and there's there's a few reasons why I have that mindset. Um, one of them is H. pylori does actually offer uh, some long-term benefits. Okay, so again, it depends on the person. So manuka honey, um, you know, again, is manuka honey alone going to wipe out H. pylori? No, but it is a gentle yet powerful antimicrobial that might be good for mild cases. Berberine, a little more aggressive. And then we have this novel probiotic, which is called Lactobacillus reuteri. And uh, you can see there the actual name DSM17648. That's a mouthful. So this particular strain of probiotic is very interesting because what it does is it actually binds up the flagella of the H. pylori Right? So H. pylori likes to swim. What it does is it actually binds up the legs, renders it immobile, and then it flushes it out through the gut without affecting anything else, which is really, really cool. So you know, think about that in the context of someone who maybe has low flora, right? So maybe they've been on rounds of antibiotics. Maybe their keystones are wiped out. Maybe their overall microbiome is very low. And if you just come along and keep hammering them with antimicrobials, uh, that might actually just keep that person stuck right there. In this particular case, though, the lactobacillus reuteri is actually not going to have an impact at all 
um, yet it's still going to do the job. It does take longer, okay? So it does take longer. Um, you're looking um, on the low end for mild cases, about eight weeks. Uh, sometimes it might even take up to six months, okay, depending. All right, so if someone had high virulence factors and it was very high numbers, I probably wouldn't go with that. Um, I might actually go with something a bit more aggressive. Okay, so we're going to move on and shift gears a little bit and talk about something else, which is very, very common these days. Uh, lots of chatter about this, and that is a small intestinal overgrowth or SIBO. And some of the uh, sort of, well, we'll talk symptomology and we'll just talk about some key points here. So generally, people with SIBO are going to react to high FODMAP foods. Uh, FODMAPs are fermentable carbohydrates, simply put. Okay. And so um, lots of healthy foods fall under the FODMAP category, right? Lots of good stuff, onions, garlic, avocado, um, you know, so they're not bad foods. They're not junk foods. They just um, happen to be the types of foods that feed these types of organisms. And then, of course, by extension, um, produce the symptoms that we're going to discuss in a minute. So uh, people who experience IBS following a bout of acute GI infection, uh, this would be traveler's diarrhea. Uh, this would be called post-infectious IBS. Uh, people who experience a temporary improvement in IBS symptoms after taking antibiotics. Okay, so... With SIBO, you got to remind yourself always that it's the bacteria and the gases that they're producing that are really driving a lot of those SIBO and, by extension, IBS symptoms. Because depending which studies you look at, there's a large percentage of people with IBS suffer from SIBO. Okay, so SIBO and IBS are very, very closely connected. And here you can see people taking antibiotics, which will temporarily wipe out the bacteria, start to see improvements in their IBS. So that's a pretty good telltale sign that someone might be dealing with SIBO. A worsening of IBS symptoms from ingesting um, probiotic supplements, and I would actually say prebiotics as well, especially FOS or fructo-oligosaccharides. So eating more fiber increases constipation and other IBS symptoms as well. You know, again, the studies are all over the place on fiber with IBS. Some studies show a huge benefit some studies show worsening and really depends on the type of fiber there. Okay, so some of the symptoms that we would be looking at here with SIBO, this is, again, by no means a complete list. Uh, bloating and abdominal gas, uh, flatulence, belching, abdominal pain, discomfort or cramps. This is pretty telltale here. Constipation, diarrhea, or a mixture of the two. So this alternating diarrhea constipation, which is a hallmark feature of uh, many types of IBS, right? So IBS type M, which is mixed. So this is dependent on the types of organisms that are overgrown and the gases that they're producing. So hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, or methane. Uh, heartburn, nausea, malabsorption, and then systemic bodily symptoms can include headaches, fatigue, joint or muscle pain, and um, certain skin conditions like psoriasis and eczema. Okay, so that's kind of what the symptom picture looks like. Um, now, we need to be very, very careful because technically we cannot diagnose, okay, so even if you're a doctor or an ND watching this, you cannot diagnose SIBO from stool testing. Very important. But stool testing can provide us with some valuable insight into overall gut health and imbalances that could be contributing to SIBO symptoms. I've gotten to the point now after running so many of these tests and looking at the symptoms um, I'm getting pretty good at going, I think you have SIBO. And then when we test for SIBO, yes, you do. Okay. So you can really tell a lot. Um, and I think on that note, I would encourage you always, no matter what space you're in, always match the, the lab testing together with the symptoms. Okay. Don't get into this habit or the trap of just treating the lab tests and the lab results without looking at the symptoms. Okay. Because really that's the full picture when you bring those things together. So, uh, these are hydrogen producers. So when you look at SIBO, what you're going to find is the hydrogen producers, their symptomology is going to look like diarrhea. Okay, so hydrogen produces a looser stool. We should also know that humans don't produce hydrogen, okay, uh, aside from water, obviously. But hydrogen gas is unique to organisms that live in us, okay, or on us. So in this particular case, We've got um, even high levels of normal bacteria here. So enterococcus and lactobacillus can actually 
produce excess hydrogen and cause a looser stool. On the other side, uh, we've got opportunistic bacteria. Uh, you can see there Bacillus enterococcus, uh, Staphylococcus, and Streptococcus. Uh, so again, these are things you want to look for on the GI map. We then have methane producers. Now, on the GI map particularly, and I would actually say on most stool tests, uh, we're not very good at detecting methane producers, right? And um, a SIBO test, a breath test, is much better at that, even though it doesn't identify the exact organism. It's just looking at the overall gas production. But here we can see methanobacteria. So, I mean, it, it literally says, the name says it all. Uh, this is actually not a bacteria per se. Um, this is what is called, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's ar archaea or archaea. Uh, so it's a different type of organism. Okay. So we then have the hydrogen sulfide producers. So we have pathogenic bacteria. Uh, so Campylobacter, um, E. coli, Salmonella, uh, Yersinia. We've got normal bacteria flora once again. And then we have these opportunistics on the right-hand side. Now, I want to just bring your attention to a couple of things here. Uh, the first one is this uh, disulfovibrio and um, also the Helicobacter pylori. So look at that. H. pylori actually produces hydrogen sulfide. So we could see potentially that there's a relationship between H. pylori and certain types of SIBO. Okay. Um, all right. I think I'm going to leave it there, and uh, we're going to push forward. And this is, again, this is the older format um, of how they presented this. Um, again, I pulled these from my files. Uh, so here we can see with SIBO, so just to remind ourselves, we're looking at SIBO here. And look at the phyla. So this is a um, real key point here. The phyla, remember, the phyla microbiota here, so our bacteria DDs and our Firmicutes, this makes up about 90% of the organisms in the gut, right? So generally, my go-to when I think about this is if I see the phyla high, either one or both, and I'm seeing the symptomology, and they're experiencing IBS, immediately I'm going, hmm, I think there's a SIBO picture here. Then I'm going to ask them about diet. So are, are you reacting to FODMAP foods? How does onion and garlic sit with you? Do you digest it well or not? Okay, so now, we're, and you start to see that picture unfold. One thing you're going to notice, and I'll, just again, a clinical tip, is you'll see that um, this Firmicutes to bacteria DDs ratio is always reported. And oftentimes I'll see people with SIBO where this ratio is perfectly fine. The ratio is fine, but everything is high, okay? If we want to expand that open a little bit more, if you look at this, this is the newer style of reporting, by the way. What do you see here? Exactly like I was just saying, right? The Firmicutes and Bacteria DDs ratio is fine, but look at where the numbers are, right? Sky high. And another clinical tip here is when you're looking at this, I want you to always look at what are the overall, what's the overall picture here? And what do we see? Trending high, trending high, trending high. Even though they might be within range, there's this general trend to bacterial overgrowth. And so a lot of the same strategies that we would bring in uh, for SIBO um, will work very, very well uh, for dysbiosis, generally speaking. Okay, maybe FODMAPs not so much, but certainly from an antimicrobial perspective, uh, it'll work really, really well. Uh, so again, more of the same here. So bacteria, DDs, and Firmicutes, I'm um, just uh, seeing those high. And just another note, um, you might see normal bacterial flora. As I said, some of them will be very, very high. Sometimes you'll see it normal. Sometimes you might even see some of them depressed or low uh, because these other bacteria are just sort of dominating, right? I also have to be very clear. These are not the bacteria or the organisms that are SIBO, if, if that makes sense, okay? So if you really want to, you know, from this, what I normally do is I go, hmm, I think you have SIBO. Let's go down the SIBO road and take that approach, or let's actually do SIBO testing to see exactly what's going on, okay? And a, a SIBO test, uh, whether you're doing, I mean, it's always breath test, but uh, a breath test is really the only surefire way to know whether someone actually has a SIBO or not. Okay, I'm just giving you some tips here on how to uh, glean some of this stuff from a stool test. So uh, here, um, really more of the same. And then, as I said, you know, you might see some of these high. Here you can see that methanobacteria. Uh, so in this particular case, it's not high, um, but it's just something that you want to watch out for. Um, I found that, uh, you know, 
again, you might not have full-blown SIBO, but when this particular organism is high, there's a lot of methane going on. And when there's a lot of methane going on, transit time and motility is going to be slowed right down. So this person is going to suffer uh, quite, a, quite a lot. Not this person here, but the person with high methanobacteria, oftentimes what you'll find is they tend towards constipation. And it doesn't matter how much water they drink or how much fiber or magnesium or anything, they're just going to suffer from that, right? Okay. Um, what you will find as well is feeding these types of bacteria, a lot of animal proteins where there's a lot of methionine. Um, it produces a lot of that methane. Uh, so sometimes peeling back on that um, can actually help to lower uh, the uh, gas produced by this organism. All right. Um, now, what you're going to see here, uh, these are um, mixed gases. So if you, you know, stop the video, if you're watching and wind it back, you'll know that um, we listed our hydrogen producers, our methane producers, and then hydrogen sulfide, right? So this particular report here is really a combination of mixed gases. And what does that look like from a symptom picture? This is the type of person that most likely will oscillate between constipation and diarrhea, okay? You will also see that there's candida there, so this person might very well uh, suffer from small intestinal fungal overgrowth or CFO, um, or they might just also have this sort of like co-infection uh, where they've got yeast and fungal issues along with that dysbiotic picture. Uh, here we can see that these are our hydrogen producers. All right, uh, hydrogen producers here, again, this is going to be a looser stool. And you'll see that there's this Klebsiella um, bacteria right at the bottom. So if you see this, uh, you'll see that it says inflammatory and autoimmune related, right? So oftentimes what you'll see is this type of picture here. You will see that there's SIBO, and then that person might have something like rheumatoid arthritis or some other type of inflammatory autoimmune issue. All right, that type of person, whatever type of inflammatory autoimmune issue it is, when you start making inroads into this, they're going to start to notice a massive reduction in uh, their inflammatory symptoms, right? So pain, perhaps skin irritations, joint pain, stuff like that. All right. So uh, another um, sort of clinical tip here, uh, low levels of uh, roseburia. This is a newer marker that a GI map brought on to their tests um, a while back. And uh, low levels here are associated with IBS. Uh, so again, um, IBS, uh, pretty close correlations there, a relationship with SIBO. So points for consideration here. Uh, we all know that a low FODMAP diet is really front frontline therapy uh, for most cases of SIBO, but it does not work for everyone, right? Some people just do not respond to it. Some people respond much better and they really have to rely on the antimicrobials. Uh, antimicrobials are pretty well indicated in all cases of SIBO. Um, even very mild ones, maybe you can get away with just a low FODMAP and some probiotics. Uh, generally speaking, though, um, I certainly have not approached it like that at all. The choice of antimicrobials are going to depend on the SIBO pattern. So are they more hydrogen dominant? Is it hydrogen sulfide? Is it methane? And I'll tell you this, methane is far more stubborn than the others. Um, it doesn't respond to a lot of antimicrobials. Uh, we definitely want to avoid probiotics, right? So how many people with IBS, for example, are taking all kinds of probiotics, thinking that they're doing this you know, great thing for themselves, and they can't understand why their symptoms are not getting better? You know, you already have too much bacteria in the gut, and now you're throwing more bacteria on, which are going to start competing, okay? Aggravating those symptoms. So my um, usual go-to is at least for the first month, sometimes for the first two months, I'm going to avoid all probiotics and prebiotics and start phasing those in as we work through things. Okay, We can use binders. Uh, for sure, there's so many different binders, uh, whether it's chlorella, charcoal, um, there's uh, fulvic and humic acids, there's carbon. I mean, there's just a whole bunch of different things. Uh, we can use that, especially for people that are very sensitive and uh, that are very easily triggered. Okay, So all that to say, I want to move on tonight, and uh, those are just a couple of examples of how I think about things, but I want to move forward and sort of uh, talk a little bit more about redefining our approach to dysbiosis, okay? You know, when I think of dysbiosis, 
And as I said, I'm coming up on 20 years now, which is kind of crazy. The way I was always taught, and it's still taught out there, is we just go with this 5R approach, right? So 5R approach is essentially remove and then repopulate. Okay, there's a couple of other steps, repair and re-inoculate and so forth. But the whole idea, the fundamental premise behind a 5R approach is just to go in there, guns blazing with antimicrobials, and then fix the collateral damage afterwards. And I tend to... Um, I, I, do, I don't subscribe to that as strongly as I did in my early days uh, because I've started to really look at these different types of pictures and think about them differently, right? So the first thing that we need to recognize is that dysbiosis is a symptom of other underlying problems. So why is it that there's a bacterial imbalance? What's actually going on? What's driving that? So is it poor digestion? Is it poor diet? So maybe low fiber, excess sugar, uh, maybe it's not organic food, so there's low-dose antibiotics, uh, which is disrupting the, the, the bacteria levels, glyphosate, pesticides. So what's going on with their diet? Is there a vi an environment that's favorable for dysbiosis to occur? Okay, and again, there's a million things that fall underneath that umbrella. But these are the things that I want to look at first in terms of ground uh, groundwork, right? There are a lot of problems with long-term restrictive diets. I mean, holy smokes, how many people are getting trapped on low FODMAP diets? Anyone in the chat box? Like low FODMAP diets, uh, candida diets, stuff like that. How many people are getting trapped on these? Okay. You know, I want you to just think about it like this. It doesn't matter. We'll talk SIBO because we were talking about it and we'll talk candida. If you have bacteria that are feeding on these fermentable carbohydrates and I remove the carbohydrates, yes, I'm starving the bacteria. Sure. Is that enough to get those levels down to the point where they're not going to cause problems? Or what happens for most people is they get the levels down, they're not feeding it anymore, so the gas goes down. But then as soon as they try and open up that diet, what happens? All the symptoms start coming back. And I see exactly the same thing happen with candida. So this is where, you know, following things through, uh, using antimicrobials in this particular sense might be a good idea together with low FODMAPs and then repopulate as you move through so that you can open the diet back up. I have um, lots of thoughts around low or no carb eating, so keto or carnivore diets. Um, you know, I did carnivore for three and a half months, which was interesting. I felt great. I'm not going to lie. I felt great. Uh, living on ketones, awesome. And then I did um, I did a stool test on myself. And what do you know? Everything came up really good, except my lactobacillus and my bifidobacterium were lower. Why? Because they weren't being fed. Okay. So I can understand a keto and carnivore diet from a metabolic standpoint. I think it's going to be very, very interesting to see the impacts of that on the microbiome long-term. Okay, and what happens there? And I just don't think that we know uh, what's going to happen there yet because we haven't, uh, you know, we don't have good data on that. All right, so the last one here, and I think this is really what we want to spend a bit more time talking about tonight, is different dysbiosis patterns require different approaches. Okay, this is really key. So again, remember I said zoom out on your testing. Low common cell species or keystones and high pathogens. I want you to think about that picture here. High pathogens, low common cells. What are we going to do? If I take antimicrobials to wipe out the pathogens, could I also inadvertently lower the common cells? Then what happens? Oops, everything goes back up. These are people that are ebbing and flowing like this, right? Oh my gosh, I'm flaring up and flaring up. Things are getting worse. I take antibiotics, things get better. I'm flaring up and flaring up. Take antibiotics, things get better, okay? People like this are stuck on cycles. So usually in these particular cases, I want to work with antimicrobials and repopulation at the same time. Sometimes you might have to start with repopulation first just to get the common cells up, and then they'll start to slowly strangle out the pathogens. What about low common cell species and no pathogens, right? So this would be more of an insufficiency type of picture where we simply just don't have enough of the good guys. So the symptomology might look very similar to if you had um, infections, right? Because remember, the metabolic activity here is going to be compromised. So in this particular case, with no pathogens and low common cells, 
forget about the 5R and move straight on to repopulation and building, right? Build that, build the, the gut microbiome up, uh, support digestion, find out where the weaknesses are. Why is it that their common cells are low? Are they not being fed? Is it, uh, you know, what is it? Is it stress? Okay. And then uh, another scenario here, high common cell species and high pathogens. This is a perfect candidate here for 5R. Okay. So we've simply got a case of way too many um, organisms and bacteria in the gut. And if I go in there with antimicrobials, boom, I bring everything down to a manageable level, and then I can repopulate so that we keep the scales tipped in our favor. All right. So this is what insufficiency dysbiosis is going to look like on a test. Okay. Um, again, nothing earth shattering here. Uh, low levels of beneficial bacteria that provide critical support for healthy intestinal and immune function. So here we can see, uh, I'm down here, I'm just reading, insufficient levels of beneficial bacteria may result in an elevated risk of intestinal infections, right? So our gatekeepers that would normally keep the bad guys in check are not there anymore. This could also lead to increased intestinal permeability, decreased protective factors such as Sig A, and increased inflammation, all right? So when you're looking at this type of test, again, this person who's presenting with low levels, low levels, low levels from long-standing infections, all right? You know, this is a person that maybe antimicrobial therapy is not the frontline therapy, okay? Maybe building, building up is going to be much better for that person. Uh, here we see a digestive insufficiency pattern. And what do we see? Um, very similar to what we saw with uh, digestive dysfunction, but you see high levels, high levels, high levels of steatocrit, low levels of pancreatic elastase. Okay, This type of person here, yes, digestive support, 100%. Get those stomach acid levels up, right? Support the gallbladder, support the pancreas, and maybe we might have to employ some antimicrobial therapy here to get some of the bacteria levels down. This is an interesting one. So here we can see markers for inflammatory dysbiosis. Okay, again, if you're watching the replay, you know, this is a good slide to just pause and uh, take in what we're looking at here. What you're going to see here, uh, low to high levels of pathogens, high levels of normal flora, which is interesting, and moderate to high levels of these opportunistic bacteria, yeast, and protozoa. So what I've done here with the uh, sort of pinkish block is I've actually highlighted the fact that these are all histamine producers, okay, which is interesting. So um, do we see these in other patterns? Absolutely. But in this particular case, this person is going to have a lot of inflammation. You will see that many of these types of bacteria are also mast cell activators. And so what that means, you know, a lot of people with mold sensitivities these days uh, a lot of people with MCAS or mast cell activation syndrome. And, uh, you know, if you run a stool test on them and these guys are high, I tell you, making inroads into getting these levels under control is going to have a mega impact in their uh, reactivity, in their uh, inflammatory load, and all of their symptoms. Okay. And, you know, how many people in those situations are using anti inflammatories? Right, whether they're drugs or whether they're herbs, you know, turmeric, curcumin, these types of things, um, you're really just putting a band-aid from the outside where you should really be looking from the inside out. Okay. Well, one thing I do want to just say here, um, you will also see that uh, secretory IgA levels often low, but sometimes elevated. Calprotectin, you know, we didn't talk about that, but calprotectin is a pretty well established marker for inflammation. Um, doctors will usually use calprotectin as a, um, a marker to sort of manage inflammatory bowel diseases. Okay. So here, um, what you'll see is calprotectin is often elevated. Um, sometimes it's low, like very low, but I've usually seen elevated. And then zonulin might actually be elevated as well. So this person might have so much inflammation that there's a leaky gut picture that's going along with this. Okay, so what you're going to see here, many, I'm just reading the second bullet, uh, second block here on the right, many pro-inflammatory microbes are gram-negative bacteria that belong to proteobacteria phylum and produce a form of lipopolysaccharide that is a potent activator of inflammatory pro uh, responses. So simply put, 
LPS is one of the most toxic and inflammatory compounds that we know of. And these bacteria should really be staying localized to the gut. And what happens in a leaky gut picture, and when we have high numbers of these organisms, is that LPS actually seeps into the bloodstream and it can trigger localized inflammation systemically throughout the body, right? So in this particular instance, uh, this type of person is going to benefit hugely from taking some type of binder. Why? Because as we go in there and wipe out these organisms, they're going to start dumping all of that LPS, right? As lo along with other metabolites. And if that goes through into the bloodstream, again, for the person that's dealing with MCAS or mold sensitivity uh, or any type of inflammatory autoimmune issue, as soon as you start working on the gut, the symptoms are going to go through the roof, okay? So binders, um, even you know things like L-glutamine and gut barrier support is a huge first step for this type of uh, di uh, th dysbiosis, okay? Because uh, I've had that before, you know, with people that are very sensitive and you just follow that 5R approach and boy, they just, you know, they're really white knuckling it for the first two weeks while they work through the die off, okay? So this here, um, since we're talking leaky guts, uh, this is what a gut barrier permeability pattern would look like. Again, this is straight from a GI map. And so here we could see any pathogen is high. Uh, lactobacillus, which is one of our bigger organisms, um, is low. And what do you see here? Low, 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 right? So a lot of these here, you know, we haven't spoken about this, but a lot of these organisms here, what they do is they actually produce short-chain fats. And those short-chain fats are fuel for the intestinal lining. So as soon as those bacteria levels are low, we don't have the fuel for the intestinal lining and things start to break down and degrade, okay? And then when, when you couple that with things like wheat and gluten sensitivities, uh, high levels of zonulin or uh, candida or any other pathogen for that matter, you can see over here, uh, that really sets the stage for them further aggravating the gut barrier and uh, again, paving the way uh, for leaky guts. So when we talk about antimicrobial therapy, Okay, I've sort of alluded to a lot of this um, just in our conversation tonight, uh, but some key points here. Our goal should really be to preserve the common cells and keystone species as much as we possibly can. Okay, so again, I would encourage you not to go in there guns blazing with high doses of antimicrobials if you don't need them. If you need them, go for it. If you don't need them, don't use them. Use antimicrobials sparingly and only when needed repopulate as quickly as possible. You know, there's so many different ways that you can approach this. And what I found anyway, is that sometimes uh, there's three different ways that I will use antimicrobials. One, I'm going to use them first, repopulate later. Two, I'm going to use them and then I'm going to start using the probiotics very, very shortly after I uh, use the antimicrobials. So within a week or two. And the other way is to do the antimicrobials and the probiotics together. Okay, so different times of the day, but you want to repopulate while you're actually using the antimicrobials. Okay, and again, those really depend on the person and the situation that you're dealing with. You can use spore-based strains. Um, they're very rapidly colonizing to crowd out pathogens. Uh, you could also rotate um, probiotics and strains. You can use immunoglobulins, very, very powerful. Uh, they are binders. Um, they support the immune system. Uh, good for leaky gut and uh, binders to mop up microbial die-off. And of course, we could also use liver gallbladder support to minimize Herx reactions or die-off reactions. Okay, so a general framework here for dysbiosis. Observe the 5R approach. Okay, so these are some scenarios here. Uh, this is current standard practice, which we've spoken about. Remove, replace, repopulate, repair, rebalance antimicrobial therapy followed by repopulation, antimicrobial therapy together with it. And for mild dysbiosis, avoid antimicrobials altogether. And we can crowd out with probiotics, prebiotics, diet, and lifestyle. And my number, maybe not number one, because I've had a few tips tonight, uh, but don't try and fix everything at once. Okay. My biggest takeaway, don't try and fix it all at once. I see this all the time. We run three tests, two tests, and now we're sitting with the hormone test. We're sitting with an organic acids test. We're sitting with a stool test. 
and we're going, oh my gosh, I got to do it all, right? Work people through phases, start with the gut, work into some of the other stuff and break it up into chunks, okay? You're not going to be able to heal all the stuff at once, all right? So that concludes my presentation. And before I hand it back over to Jason, uh, many of you do know that um, next month, um, our continuing education program starts with IHN, and that is the Digestive Health Practitioner Masterclass. Um, I'm just going to briefly show you what that's about. I got two slides here, and um, obviously um, IHN will be sharing more information about that. Uh, but uh, this is an official continuing edu education program with IHN. Um, you do get a certificate of completion, this continuing education credits. And just to give you a glimpse as to what's inside, uh, we've got a ton of resources here. Um, the book that you see, uh, that took me a long time to write on and off many years. And uh, it's a very dense 145 page book uh, with um, protocols, pathology, diagnostic stuff. Like it's, you know, it's not a Saturday, um, you know, page turner at the beach. Uh, it's definitely a reference manual. And then you can see a bunch of other um, tools and guides for you to use. Uh, we've got about 25 hours, it might be a little bit more, of pre-recorded content that's released over eight weeks. We've got live Q&As. Uh, you have lifetime access to all the content. And then uh, you'll see um, protocols, guidelines, food lists, meal plans, uh, functional lab test cheat sheets. So we do talk a lot about functional labs there. Uh, we've got a therapeutic dosage guide. And then, um, as I said, certificate of completion and 13 hours of continuing education credits. Um, I'm very proud to say that over the years, um, I've had the opportunity to work with some pretty awesome companies, uh, both supplement companies, um, labs. We've got some guest training from Microbiome Labs, from Vitrack, from Food Marble, and um, so forth. So, uh, yeah, if you're interested in joining me April 8th, um, definitely stay tuned to your inbox. Okay. And um, follow up with IHN and uh, we will be following up with you. So I'm going to take some questions. Jason, do you want me to stop share or? Yeah, let's stop. Uh, let's stop the share. And we got uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so for questions. But first, Brett, let me just thank you. That was an awesome talk. Thank you. Yeah, such good information in there. So and I see the 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 Q&A box starting to blow up. So just before I get to the questions, just to follow up on uh, what Brett was just saying, I'm sharing a link here in the chat um, where you can learn more about the digestive masterclass um, and enroll in it. I see Melissa making a comment here that she highly recommends this class. We've so what, over 300 people have gone through this masterclass and the feedback yeah. that in is always very positive. So it's definitely worth uh, exploring and checking out. Okay. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Thanks for that. And thanks, Melissa. I know I've known you for a while now. I always get people show up to the webinars as well that have already taken programs and stuff. So it's, it's good validation. Thank you so much. All right. Um, okay. So let's, uh, let's start with, um, so we got a question from Karen here with the impact of bile acids on the GI tract acidity and the microbiome. Mm -hmm. Can we overdo bile acid support? Um, short answer is yes, you can. Okay. Um, I think it's also, we need to be very clear on, there's, it's not a, it's not a cutoff, right? So it's not like it's an on-off switch. It's really a gradient, and so some people can, you know, this again comes back to this whole idea of root cause resolution, where if the if the bile is not flowing, the question should be why is it not flowing, right? So yes, we can use bile acids as a supplement, but we don't want to become dependent on that. We really want to fix the liver gallbladder, which is usually what the problem is, right? So, and of course, there's so many different nutraceuticals, I mean, sulfur-based amino acids, um, milk, thistle, all these types of things, uh, black walnuts, all help getting bile uh, to flow. And typically what I found anyway um, is when you first work with it, you start to see lots of benefits. And then I always try and wean people off, right? As we're starting to work on the liver and gallbladder. One other thing that you should be aware of as well is bile has very powerful antimicrobial properties. So when you actually use bile on an empty stomach and someone's really got a lot of dysbiosis going on, um, they're going to blow up, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to start slow and uh, really work them into it. Okay. Okay. Um, so with acid reflux, um, someone that's been taking PPIs for years, uh, can they still use the bitters and zinc and HCL that you recommended while they are taking the PPIs? 
it is, uh, you know, I've got, um, I'll say a protocol to wean people off PPIs in the masterclass. It is not foolproof and it's not easy, you know? So the, the problem with PPIs is, you know, depending on which studies you read, but let's just safely say that after a year, it's very, very difficult for you to start producing your own stomach acid again. Okay. Cause it really shuts down 98% of your stomach acid production. So this is why I always try and like, you know, like just try and get off PPIs or try and prevent going on them in the first place. Uh, but you know, if someone's been on them for 20 years, um, a couple of things that I would mention is yes, you could still use digestive enzymes to help break down the food, et cetera, but those people really need minerals. Okay. What the, the number one side effect from PPIs is osteoporosis. Okay. Which is, you know, loosely put broad spectrum mineral deficiency. Okay. Because, you know, we didn't talk about it, but stomach acid is needed to ionize minerals. So it's really, really critical for that. Okay. Okay. Now, what if a client has no gallbladder? What is the best way to increase HCL when they don't react well with HCL support? Yeah. So um, remember that the gallbladder, there's a, there's a number of reasons why that might not have worked properly. Um, so the acid trigger, which is what we spoke about, is just one mechanism. Uh, but obviously there's liver congestion, you know, there's a bunch of toxicity, there's a bunch of stuff um, that could be contributing to why that gallbladder was removed in the first place. Uh, so if you're reacting negatively to stomach acid, what might actually be happening, oh, sorry, HCL as a supplement, what might actually be happening is you're producing sufficient amounts of HCL already. Okay, great. In that case, what you want to do is you're probably having problems with fat digestion. And in that instance, uh, taking fat digestive enzymes without HCL is probably going to work much better for you. Okay. So you could, and, and long term, right? So you could actually take that long term. Okay. When you do choose to use antimicrobials, do you have a favorite product or resources for which products to choose? Honestly, it really depends. I mean, I've got like so many saved and bookmarked. It really depends on what I'm doing. So I don't have any favorites. Um, you know, there's ones that are better for SIBO, for example. There's other ones that are better for Candida. There's, you know, so it really depends. And I think the other thing um, that I would say is it also depends heavily on the person. You know, some antimicrobials now, they'll actually have liver support together with it. You know, so that kind of real sensitive person, um, I'm going to go with that. I might also go with a liver and liver support with the binder together. So it really depends on, on what's going on with that person. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will say this though, um, my sort of thinking around it, 90% um, of the time, I'm going to go with things that are broad spectrum as opposed to very narrow. Okay. So I very rarely am I going to go with a black walnut or straight oregano or something like that. I like to. Because what happens is, you know, and on the old school uh, stool tests where they would culture the tests, I mean, old school, some of them still do that. When they cultured the tests, um, what they would do with the culturing is they would expose them to antimicrobials to see which ones would work better. And I used to run a lot of those back in the day because it's all we had. And uh, what I would find is that um, those organisms, some of them would only be sensitive to one or two um, herbs or maybe even silver. So what happens if you go with something that's just laser focused, well, you might be choosing the wrong thing altogether. Whereas broad spectrum, it creates um, a lot more synergy and, and they're more potent. Okay. Also lower dosages uh, required. The masterclass, is it open to people outside IHN? Yeah, it's open to anyone. It's so, um, you know, because uh, I think it was a question in the chat, like what if you're not certified yet? Um, it is open to students. There's a couple of prerequisites. So you do need to have taken uh, fundamentals and at least symptomology one, um, just so that you kind of have a bit of a grounding. And uh, if you're not from IHN and you're certified, you, you're welcome to join as well. No problem. Awesome. How long, and I mean, maybe, maybe a rough timeline, but how long does it take to heal leaky gut? And what are the best supplements for it? Uh, that's such a uh, huge question. Uh, massive back, topic. But... Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, what else is going on, right? Like, yeah. let's put it this way. So, you know, with leaky gut, the thing that you got to recognize is that um, if we're constantly uh, consuming things, whatever those things are, if we're consuming things that are aggravating the leaky gut and then this, and feeding organisms that are driving that, and then we just simply add more supplements on top, that's going to take a really long time. If we, if we remove the assaults, 
Okay, so we remove the things that are aggravating it. Then we've created an environment that's conducive to healing. And when we've created that environment and then drop supplements on, everything is sped up. So, you know, the 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 lining of the GI tract is amazing in that those cells turn over every 10 days. Contrast that to your brain and nervous system, which takes seven years, right? So the gut can heal very, very quickly if you give it the right environment. Um, I've had people with Crohn's, um, yeah, a few people with Crohn's, where they've been in such a bad state that they've been hospitalized, you know, every week because of flare-ups and stuff like that. And simply removing the assaults, all of their symptoms gone within four days. Not fixed, not resolved but gone and tamed right down, you know? So it's a testament to this whole idea that removing the triggers is probably more important than what supplements we're going to add on top, okay? I will say this, though. Leaky gut, the spectrum, in terms of time frame, can be anywhere up to two years, depending on how um, severe, severe it is and how sort of targeted the treatment approach is as well. Okay. What other reasons could be contributing to looser stool other than hydrogen producers? And what tests would be beneficial? Um, I mean, I think a couple of things that come to mind. Um, one would be food sensitivities of some kind. So food allergies, food sensitivities, um, for sure. Uh, another one would be um, stress would be another one. You know, so a lot of people, particularly with IBS, they'll tell you that, you know, and, and I should sort of add this. With IBS, you know, as much as we've spoken about SIBO and FODMAPs, there's a huge stress component, like major. And so this is actually, you know, in the masterclass, we talk a little bit about stress and uh, looking at that because some people, you know, the FODMAPs, the antimicrobials and stuff like that is, is, is a good chunk of the puzzle, but they're constantly being bombarded by stress and their response to that stress is usually diarrhea. Okay. So in that case, you know, adrenal stress testing might be good. Uh, maybe you want to look at food sensitivity testing to see if there's something there. Okay, uh, We know that things like lactose intolerance, for example, always going to produce a looser stool. Okay, Sometimes um, if you're very sensitive to gluten as well, uh, that can also produce a looser stool. Okay. I have a GI map for a client where all the intestinal markers came up clear and <laughs> there are some H markers on the opportunistic bacteria and commensal markers and just mm-hmm. parasite something showed up but not enough to show h this confused me and she has diarrhea leaky gut food intolerance and inflammation yeah yeah well i think um you know in that sense just again i'm not looking at anything so it's kind of hard um but uh, you know it sounds to me like you've got a lot of high organisms and everything else is normal um in that case you know working with some antimicrobials to bring those levels down uh, maybe bringing in probiotics or something like that sooner than later. Uh, I think something else that I'll throw out there, uh, you know, and very important, is that a stool test doesn't show us what's going on higher up in the small intestine, right? Yes, we can see, perhaps we can see candida. Yes, we could see some things, but it's not really designed for that. It's really to show us what's going on in the large intestine. Okay, Zondylin, for example, Zondylin systemic, So that's a little bit different. So it is showing us what's going on on the GI tract um, to some degree or another. But in that instance, you know, I I think um, if you're you're just relying on a GI map, I might be looking at a SIBO test. You know, she she might have SIBO and it's just, you know, the markers are not going to come up on a GI map. But if you've tried stuff based on that pattern and you're still not getting traction, uh, definitely consider um, maybe running a SIBO test or going down that road. Okay. Okay. I'm mean, just so everyone knows, I'm going to try to get to a few more questions, but I see they're still coming in. So I might have to close it before we get to all the questions. So I apologize. But um, like Brett said, I would say go back, watch the replay when it comes out, because I know some of this stuff was uh, was talked about and we might you might pick up on things the second time around. Um, so question here, do you think Crohn's disease can be a result of things like SIBO, leaky gut and dysbiosis that have been missed and not healed for years? 100%. With, with, without question, I mean Crohn's is leaky gut, by like by ne- by definition, right? Um, just between Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, Crohn's tends to be um, like small intestine and large intestine. Uh, ulcerative colitis tends to be more located to the to the uh, colon specifically. But yeah, when you look at the keynotes, one hundred percent SIBO for sure, um, absolutely. Okay, not always SIBO, but dysbiosis, yeah. 
Yeah, that was my personal story. I mean, Crohn's as a teenager and it wasn't until I was in my 30s studying at IHN that all the light bulbs went off. Yeah. And now there's some very interesting studies with single organisms, you know, um, from a scientific perspective that have shown up consistently high across multiple people with Crohn's. Okay, yeah. So again, infectious agents, you know, if you want to look at it like that. Uh, what therapy would you recommend for a person who has been treated for H. pylori with aggressive antibiotics? Um, well, I don't think that there's any treatment beyond that. It's like the triple antibiotics work pretty well. Um, I think, you know, again, it really depends. Are we showing signs and symptoms? You know, what, if, if you're asymptomatic after taking triple antibiotic therapy, then you're all good. You know, I, I wouldn't say you need anything else. Um, something we didn't talk about tonight is that, you know, one of the, H. pylori is heavily implicated with ulcers, okay? So when you start going down that road, you know, if you had high H. pylori, let's say, and you had ulcer as well, the first step is really getting rid of the H. pylori. The second step is then going to be um, healing the, uh, the the gastric mucosa. Uh, so things like zinc, carnosine, um, L-glutamine, for example, uh, those are all good things. Slippery elm, um, licorice DGL, like all these types of things will help to repair the lining of the stomach. And then you also want to get your HCL levels back up, okay? Because um, the H. pylori would have suppressed that over a long period of time. Hmm. What about improving HCL in children if they can't swallow caps or take bitters, et cetera? Uh, well, they could take bitters. I mean, bitters is like, you know, it's liquid. Um, you know, generally you wouldn't take bitters in a capsule. You need the taste, okay? I think, um, you know, with children... Um, I, I'm not a pediatric specialist by any stretch, but I have worked with children. And I, oftentimes what I found is that the things that we think are happening as adults, particularly like low HCL, you know, low HCL is something that usually happens over a longer period of time. You know what I mean? Um, I, in children, oftentimes there's functional disorders. And so you might find that there's some spinal misalignments, uh, maybe there's sub, some subluxations, um, osteopathic adjustments work really, really well. Um, I've had a couple of kids where I just said, look, I don't think I'm your guy. Um, I think you should go and see an osteopath. And after three or four sessions, they've called me back and they're like, wow, you know, suddenly my kid's digestion is working way better. So I think, um, you know, I, I would be hesitant to say for sure that a young child absolutely has low stomach acid, you, you know, uh, technically speaking. Okay. There might be other stuff going on. Stress, you know, stress, trauma, like all shuts down uh, stomach acid production. You know, it's in fight or flight. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Last question, maybe to finish it off. Um, what's, uh, healing the gut, any other like lifestyle suggestions that you, that you typically work with clients or provide clients? Oh my gosh. How much time we got? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you, you know, I think that, um, I sort of alluded it, uh, to it before, um, like lifestyle, you know, and, and so something I sort of really, I sort of, I wouldn't have pushed it aside for many years, but I didn't really focus as much on it was the whole idea of stress. You know, I think that stress, um, especially nowadays, you know, I used to just sort of go, okay, just manage stress, you know, maybe go do some yoga and I don't know, take it easy, you know? And now I started to just gain a whole different kind of appreciation as to the mechanics of what's going on with stress. And just a couple of things, you know, um, your Every time that you have like a stress response, right, whether it's acute, whether it's chronic, but particularly chronic stress, what's actually happening is that HPA axis is firing all the time. And what people don't realize is that the microbes in the gut are actually responding to the neurotransmitters that are being produced. So all of your stress hormones and your neurotransmitters, we now have good data to show that they actually influence microbial diversity in the gut, mm -hmm. which is wild to think, Right. We also know that um, certain neurotransmitters and stress hormones can fuel biofilm growth, uh, can fuel bacterial overgrowth. Because think of, you know, opportunists, right? So what is an opportunist? It sees an opportunity. Well, if your stress hormones are super high, what is the message that they're getting? It says, hey, the host is weak. The host is stressed out. And now we also have very good data to show that high stress levels suppress secretory IgA and SIG-A. So high, high cortisol has an inverse relationship with your 70% of your immune system, you know, which is, uh, happens to be in your gut. So there's so many different things that are going on there, um, so much so that now we actually have this class of probiotics called psychobiotics, 
where psychobiotics, when you take them, they can actually influence your brain, which is kind of crazy to think, right? From in from within the gut. So that whole gut brain connection, um, stress managing lifestyle, I think is is a very overlooked piece when it comes to gut health. To be to be perfectly frank, mm-hmm. no, that makes sense. I mean, because like you, like someone could be going through these five R's and or, or parts of it on like a cyclical basis, and they're not dealing with the fact that yeah, there's this dysfunction in the stress response. You know? Yeah, totally. Cool stuff. Well, Brett, thank you again. Um, yeah, really appreciate your time. And uh, thank you everybody for for joining. Make sure to check out the masterclass link that I shared in the chat, or you can visit the IHN website. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, everyone. And thanks, uh, Jason. Um, hope to see uh, many of you in our masterclass where we're going to just blow this open for eight weeks and talk about all sorts of cool stuff. All right. Awesome. So uh, thanks so much. And um, lots of faces, lots of names that I recognize here. So I appreciate you hopping on and uh, joining us tonight. Great. Okay. Take care. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye.